live from London, England, it's theCUBE. Covering Discover 2016 London. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now here's your host, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. We're back in London at uh, London Excel. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. This is HPE Discover 2016. Milan Shetty is here. He's the Chief Technology Officer of the Data Center Infrastructure Group, recently promoted. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, formerly CTO Storage Group, now the entire Data Center Infrastructure Group. Fantastic. So, uh, just a few months in, right? Yep, and, yep. Uh, how's it going? It's going great. It's like the, this role is kind of, if you want to use the industry buzzword, my role now is hyper-converged. <laughs> <laughs> Storage and networking put together, might as well say that is the uh, It's apropos, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's going great. I think, um, so, uh, and we, as we have been watching the industry, right, and as, uh, uh, as you have reported many times, compute storage and networking is coming together, right, in many forms and how they get deployed. And it was only a matter of time um, where even the, even the uh, buying cycles and the hyper-conversion, the convert space has shown, and also internally, organization, organizationally, putting it all together makes, uh, makes a lot of sense from trying to get the change and the integrations done faster, quicker, and in a more agile way. So. Well, there's no doubt that your organization is, is converging, kind of converging under Antonio's yep. uh, you know, governance, and uh, so that's good. Uh, where do you see sort of the role of storage now uh, as, as a predominant server company? Yeah. Um, you see storage and server beginning to come together. What happens to this sort of bespoke storage world? Yeah, so um, so I think there's a, uh, the bespoke storage or the external storage. So if we look at it, uh, actually we think that there are three topologies with, where storage is going to exist. The first topology is the topology which we know externally attached to compute. That's going to be here for a while because there is a need and many use cases where you want to add compute scale independent of the storage scale. So from a use case standpoint, that, that topology of external storage is going to be around for a while because again, uh, you want to add, in many cases, compute independent of storage uh, uh, from a scale standpoint. Second topology is going to be servers with internal storage and you rack them and stack them. Um, so either in pizza box form factor or large form factor and in that, in that case, you are scaling compute and storage in incremental chunks. So that architecture has got some uh, interesting properties. You can't really scale compute and storage independent of each other. So if you need more compute, you're still adding storage. If you need more storage, you're adding compute. But there are a lot of use cases, especially when it comes to uh, data which could be in a Hadoop platform, as an example and everything. Perfect fit for that. Large term archival repository, perfect fit for that. That's the second topology. The third topology which is emerging is, uh, is actually a byproduct of um, the uh, the machine project we had, um, uh, um, and we call it the memory centric computing, or memory driven computing. And the core philosophy there is, uh, from a topology standpoint, is that in any use cases, the working set which you work with is actually really small in a lot of use cases. If what would a world look like if that working set was in a central pool of memory? and there were a bunch of computes which were accessing it simultaneously or synchronously or what have you. The advantage of that architecture is that a um, lot of applications would actually need less compute because data is in one place, it's preserved, it's persistent, and your compute is getting to the data with the memory speed rather than the network moving the data back and forth, trying to figure out which compute attaches to other. So I think from a storage standpoint and from data standpoint, the three topologies are going to, uh, the one which already exists today, the second, uh, the external storage, the uh, cloud providers made the servers with internal storage as the, uh, as the new player, and the memory centric computing. So storage will ex actually exist in all three places. So to talk about a great segue into the machine. This is really the big news coming out today of, yeah. of the conference HPE yesterday demonstrating components of the machine. Yeah. Um, what, and a lot of tea leaf reading going on right now about what was really important about that, uh, that demonstration. What should customers take away from what you demonstrated? Right, so, so, um, so, 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 so great question. So one of the uh, persistent memory um, and applications benefiting, applications whose 
data set can fit in cache. Cache is exist today and the cache density is only going to increase. Um, they are gigabytes today, they are only going to, terabytes you can also put together, but they are expensive, but, if you, but you can do that, gigabytes and terabytes. What, what we wanted to show with the machine initially was that um, when persistent memory comes in and when you're, uh, and what I mean by persistent memory is that server, server gets powered off, your data is still there. Um, server comes back on, your, your, uh, you can just read the data rather than having to bring the data from the network and the storage to the, uh, to the compute side. So uh, when we launched the machine program, one of the things we wanted to educate the marketplace was how would the world, and especially the application uh, providers and application writers, what would a world look like if uh, you never have to be afraid of reboots? Um, you, the way you would handle things would be very different. Now, we couldn't call it from a marketing standpoint, you know, we're going to make reboot go away. That's not that sexy from a marketing standpoint. But here's what, here's what containers is doing and also machine is doing, right? Um, in, in the world of containers, services can be just powered on and off or moved around, the virtualization moved around. Machine is never rebooted. Machine reboot takes minutes, sometimes hours, depending on how long since you last minute because it has to go through all its physical checks and everything. But as you are scaling the applications and everything, you want to be able to just move stuff around, restart the, restart the service, take seconds, right? But when you're restarting the uh, seconds, what happens to the data? If the data had the proximity to that container, it might as well be with the compute because that was the working set of the container. And if in, the, in, in that machine, the data is going to be the, or in the server, I should not use the word machine here, overloaded, but if in that server, you never have to go get the data from the storage. Your working set is always in the cache. You're keeping the second copy um, for, for, uh, for protection reasons and everything on the external storage. How you write applications, how you deploy applications, and how you scale applications dramatically changes. Um, you, could, you could just completely dramatically changes, and also it, that has a big cost benefit. You may not need as much cores. And but not as, as but uh, avoiding story. reboots or, or shortening reboot time doesn't seem to be a very compelling use case. So uh, it's, what it's, I was using it as one, uh, one example. When you're scaling at a large, it's not a, it's, uh, it is one of the side effects. That's why I was, uh, I was mentioning that it's not a, uh, the containers also makes, makes it easier. No, it's the, when you're scaling services uh, and when you're thousands and thousands of machines, you're trying to do a firmware upgrade uh, as an example and you have to take the machine down. For example, what happens to the services? You, there are large outages or large scale deployments actually don't want to change their infrastructure, don't want to add capacity, don't add, add because the, the limits of the uh, limits of the cloud infrastructure breaks pretty fast. What we're saying is that by doing memory centric and one of the persistent memory, you actually need less infrastructure. That's the first benefit. Because your working set is right there, right close to the, close to the data. So the first benefit is really the working set uh, is closer, so you need less infrastructure to do the same amount of job. So that's a big mm -hmm. win. Faster. Um, and the second win is you can actually service your, you can decouple the servicing of the hardware from servicing of your application. Um, and that's a big benefit for a large, uh, large set of service providers. So you're moving so less it. data. You're moving data around less, uh, swapping it between storage and memory. That's right. It's all in one big shared memory pool. Well, how is this enabling the kind of dramatic uh, performance improvements that HP was talking about yesterday? Uh, absolutely. So if you look at the entire working set of, uh, so I'll just pick traditional applications like which are built on Oracle and SQL and everything. Largest Oracle or SAP instances you will see is like handful of terabytes after you do three or four ter that's all is now, that's not going to need, require network bandwidth at all. It's sitting right next to compute. Mm. So your entire Oracle query is going to run at memory speed because the eight terabyte, 10 terabyte Oracle databases are considered big size databases. And now you can just do it in one blade. So can you talk about practically how this is going to show up in, in products? HP was talking about uh, 2018, 2019. Are we going to see a device called the machine or are we going to see this, this technology pervade the whole product line? I, it, it's, the, it's the latter. It, the, there is not going to be a thing called the machine and then everybody writes to the machine. Machine will be the concept and the technology which will 
which will change the way, the, the memory centric way on how the uh, applications are going to be deployed and sped up. So the first place where the technology will show um, is actually going to be in part of my old job in storage. So, so if you think about it, um, uh, three par um, working set, when you look at the storage systems architecture, you have, um, the, if you just look at the external storage, and if you open up the external storage, it actually looks like compute. Uh, it's got CPU, it's got memory, it's got storage, and it does a lot of caching and everything. So now, with persistent memory, and big persistent memory out there, uh, on the motherboard itself, your entire no working set. No caching. No caching. No flash. No flash and everything. You will actually need less of the north-south traffic. You need, uh, in, in case of a three part, less north-south traffic, which means it can host more virtual machines. Which means you can now host more containers in the same footprint or perhaps even lesser. And that at medium is Memristor? Uh, so it could be, it could be, uh, it doesn't have to be Memristor. It could be battery back dims because they have the similar properties. Uh, as member uh, it could be battery. I think initially it will be battery back dims and 3D cross point. Um, right. Okay. So, but if fundamentally you're talking about Milan collapsing this storage hierarchy, which that's is correct. caches and DRAMs yeah. and non-volatile RAMs and flash and spinning disk gets collapsed. Now that yeah. doesn't necessarily say cheap and deep goes away. Maybe right. tape and okay, fine. Um, what about cost? Um, so yeah, so the the uh, persistent memory <coughs> and the 3D cross point have reached a place where their cost is very comparable to what you get today as DRAMs, and it will only go down because the volumes will be there. The uh, the the other use case I was going to mention in addition to the storage use case is IoT. Mm -hmm. Are you going to move all the data from all the sensors to a public cloud or your IT as a cloud, or you're going to do some computing closer to where you collected the data? And if you have the, in, in, even in the IoT set of things, right, so you can envision uh, smaller servers, self-contained, self-packaged, then they will, they will sit closer to the edge, they will do all their computing, they need the entire database instances and everything, they need right there. Doing streaming analytics and, and then feeding subsets yeah. of that data up to yeah, the server. Yeah, and only the change, change logs or change delta will be sent back to the central IT shop, but all of the compute work and everything is done there because there is not enough bandwidth available today to get all the IoT sensors data to a central data center, process them, and send them back. A, you don't have the time, and you don't have the bandwidth. Time is in the real time decision making and everything. So, uh, so that, is, that is where this is going to be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. IBM is putting a lot of its uh, research effort into quantum computing right now. HP has been, uh, HP has been uh, focusing on, on the memory technology. Uh, are these competitors with each other? No, is, they're is not, it... they're, they're different approaches. Uh, there are different approaches, and uh, what, we, what we mean by that is um, um, that um, we believe the de um, that the center of the universe is going to be not compute, and it's kind of hard for, for a compute company. Yeah, and a yeah. Center of the universe is going to be data and memory, mm -hmm. and compute will attach to that pool of memory and storage will attach to the pool of memory for persistent, uh, for keeping second copy or longer copy, longer archival and everything. But the but uh, HPE's approach, and thanks to our machine project and also all of the data we got from the IoT uh, use cases and everything, we talked to the customers around that, the center of the universe for the next decade is going to be memory, not compute. So flash in that scenario becomes subservient to that that, is absolutely that right. persistent uh, memory. Yeah, the, uh, the flash would be the backup copy of the well, persistent memory so or, come or back longer to, copy. So I'm going to come back to cost. You said, yeah. you said you know, today persistent memories yeah. are competitive with DRAM. Okay, what about competitive with flash? I mean, this has a huge advantage, does it not? That's right, that's right. You could, you could use, the, if you go back in history, that was the same case between flash and disk. Um, the uh, flash economic change because smartphones happened and the volume existed. Right now there are only two DRAM suppliers really. Uh, and they're both South Korean companies and they're, the market is captured by two DRAM suppliers and uh, the material cost versus the cost we pay are not, the economics is not following the Adam Smith theory. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so just like when smartphones came in there were going to be billions of smartphones and rather than having a smartphone with hard disk drive, the smartphones got flash in, 
the pivotal, the tipping point of this is going to be IoT. Because IoT cannot afford, flash is too slow in some instances. So the volume is going to come from IoT, and it's a, it's a, so when, when you have millions of sensors, and each one of has got small chip, which really is a memory chip, that changes the uh, volume. For just like what smartphones did to disk and flash industry, the thesis is, that the IoT okay. is going to do so memory to and the flash industry. And, and, and memory, volatile memory plus flash um, is not going to be, the, in your scenario, is not going to be the paradigm because uh, non-volatile memory will replace the volatile memory, the That's DRAM. Right. That's right, because, you, okay. because the cost and, of battery. And then that volume will allow it to cross with flash. That's right, that's right. Okay, that's well, right. at least it's a plausible scenario. We'll see if the volumes you know, absolutely, absolutely. There. There's a Great long example. way to go. There's a, there's <laughs> a long way to go, but just like the smartphones just showed up and yeah. one day, this and fast. flash transition happened. Less than we, a decade. Less than a decade it happened, uh. and I think that, well, so we'll, we'll start showing up persistent memory use cases in the storage arrays, then we'll show up in the certain uh, server product lines, and once people realize that actually, you know what, and then it's all about packaging, right? Then, then the IoT devices can just package the non-volatile memory, take a compute, uh, and just pack up some non-volatile mm -hmm. memory and only send change logs to the central IT shop, maybe on the flash devices, uh, because that, uh, and yeah. it changes in a hurry. That's well, why our strategy is memory-centric, not CPU-centric. We agree, the data stays at the edge, 95% of it anyway. So, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And if, that, and if we follow that trail, the uh, breadcrumb, if data stays at the edge, and most of the data is going to be captured by IoT, then IoT is going to do to memory and flash what what flash smartphones did, did to uh, flash and disks. Yeah, that's Excellent. why we are that's why we're focused on that. Great All right, Milan, well, uh, good discussion. We got to leave it there. Thanks very much for coming to the Cube and uh, sharing you. your insights. Thank Great you. Stuff. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Paul and I will be back with our next guest right after this short break. <laughs>